Okay, hello everybody. This is uh, Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Tonight we're continuing in our study of the book of Job. Uh, we're going to begin with chapter 36, verse 1, and see how far we can get. Uh, if you have not seen all the previous studies on Job, uh, I hope you will go back and watch this from the beginning. This book in particular, uh, you must keep in context the first two chapters as you're going through the remainder of the book. Otherwise, it could cause a lot of confusion and, and uh, false conclusions. All right, before we get started, though, let me ask uh, Brother Eric and Brother Stephen to introduce themselves. Hello, it's me again, the homo. Okay, back to you. Hey, everybody. It's Stephen here, known as Stephen Rivers TV on YouTube. You know, here for another night of fellowship, you know, learning and spreading the gospel. All right. Okay, thank you, brothers. Uh, so, without further ado, uh, we will. I will read the entire chapter 36 uh, in context in the KJV. Uh, listen carefully. <clears throat> After I read it, I'm going to ask you to kind of pick a, a title for the chapter based upon what you think the main theme of the chapter is, and then then we'll go through it more slowly in the Amplified version. Okay, so let's begin now. Elihu also proceeded and said, Suffer me a little, and I will show thee that I have yet to speak on God's behalf. I will fetch my knowledge from afar, and will ascribe righteousness to my Maker. For truly my word shall not be false. He that is perfect in knowledge is with thee. Behold, God is mighty and despiseth not any. He is mighty in strength and wisdom. He preserveth not the life of the wicked, but giveth right to the poor. He withdraweth not his eyes from the righteous, but with kings are they on the throne. Yea, he doth establish them forever, and they are exalted. And if they, are, if, if they be bound in fetters, and be holden in cords of affliction, then he showeth them their work and their transgressions that they have exceeded. He openeth also their ear to discipline, and commandeth that they return from iniquity. If they obey and serve him, they shall spend their days in prosperity and their years in pleasures. But if they, do, if they obey not, they shall perish by the sword, and they shall die without knowledge. But the hypocrites in heart heap up wrath. They cry not when he bindeth them. They die in youth, and their life is among the unclean. He delivereth the poor in his affliction, and openeth their ears in oppression. Even so, uh, would he have removed thee out of the strait into a broad place where there is no straightness, and that which should be set on thy table should be full of fatness. But thou hast fulfilled the judgment of the wicked. Judgment and justice take hold of thee. Because there is wrath, beware, lest he take thee away with his stroke. Then a great ransom cannot deliver thee. Will he esteem thy riches? No, not gold, nor all the forces of strength. Desire not the night, when people are cut off in their place. Take heed, regard not iniquity, for this hast thou chosen rather than affliction. Behold, God exalteth by his power, who teacheth like him. Who hath enjoined him his way? Or who can say, thou hast wrought iniquity? Remember that thou magnify his work, which men behold. Every man see it, man may behold it afar off. Behold, God is great, and we know him not. Neither can the number of his years be searched out. For he maketh small the drops of water. They pour down rain according to the vapor thereof, which the clouds do drop and distill upon man abundantly. 
Also, can any understand the spreadings of the clouds or the noise of his tabernacle? Behold, he spreadeth his light upon it and covereth the bottom of the sea. For by them judgeth he the people. He giveth meat in abundance. With clouds he covereth the light and commandeth it not to shine by the cloud that cometh betwixt. The noise thereof sheweth concerning it, the cattle also concerning the vapor. Okay, uh, you guys did not decide who would speak first tonight, so go ahead, whoever wants to, and see if you can give me a title for that chapter. Uh, it's been several uh, episodes since we did do the rock, paper, scissor lock casting to decide who went first. But if, if you'd like to re-challenge the original, uh, then uh, what about you, Stephen? Well, Eric, you did go first here, so I guess that kind of gives you the nod for tonight. But anyway, I'll give out, you know, I guess my title for this chapter. I guess just from what I inferred, I would say it's Elihu talks about God's judgment, I guess, in this one. Uh, oh, yeah, that's great. Okay, so uh, does this mean you're going to be going first all night or what? <laughs> okay. Now, I would like to give it a... Huh? Um, well, I said that you talked first so that you should be going first, but we shouldn't have a debate on this now because uh, we don't have all the time in the world to do that. So we'll just say you're going first tonight. Oh, okay. Uh, I would say this chapter heading should be called The Blank Between the... Righteous and the wicked. Okay, fill in the blank. Back to you. Okay. Uh, I think uh, Brother Stevens' uh, uh, choice of a title is similar to this one that the Amplified Version uses. It says, Elihu speaks of God's dealings with men. And uh, I think you said, Elihu speaks of God's judgment on men. And so that's very, very close to uh, the title that the Amplified chose. Now, <clears throat> I think it's worth mentioning again that um, when, they, when they wrote the, the Bible, uh, the, the, they didn't write titles for the, the names of the books and for the ch names of the chapters and subtitles. They didn't put titles in there. That's not part of Scripture. Uh, if we have a title, it's only because a publisher or a translator is trying to help us out by giving it a title so that we understand the basic theme of the chapter or, or that subtitle, which is, would tell us the theme of the, the, that particular portion of Scripture. Uh, so the title should not be misconstrued to be actual Scripture, but sometimes it could be helpful to us. So... Um, let me, uh, so the, now you see the title is Elihu Speaks of God's Dealings with Men. Um, before I go through it verse by verse, do you want to respond to that? Congratulations, Stephen. That's your first point, or have you got any points before now I wasn't aware of? Well, I mean, I don't think I have any points. It's not about me being a better person than anybody else, but as opposed to this, I don't have any additional comments as of right now. All right, let me go on now. I'm going to read this in the Amplified more slowly. It says, Elihu continued and said, Bear with me a little longer, and I will show you that there is yet more to say on God's behalf. I will bring my knowledge from afar and will ascribe righteousness to my Maker. For truly, my words are not false. He who is perfect in knowledge is with you. Behold, God is mighty and yet does not despise anyone nor regard any as trivial. He is mighty in the strength and power of understanding. I'll stop there after verse 5. And let me ask you to respond to that. Well, 
Well, I just uh couldn't stop thinking about uh Steven not wanting his points. Can I have his points? Well, you'll have to wait to get to heaven to see if you got any points or treasures in heaven from anything you've done here. Oh, okay. all right. Well, okay, I guess to respond to those first couple of verses here, I guess, well, I mean, he's saying that he still has yet to even, you know, really talk about, like, what he has to say, I guess, on God's behalf. And then he's now talking about what he's about to speak, you know, for God in this statement. But we've got more about his judgment coming up, but right now he's just pretty much getting ready to go to, like, dig in deeper to this type of stuff. Okay, um, uh, well, first, his first beginning here, of course, he says, Elihu continued and said, bear with me a little longer. So, you know, this is telling us, and this is connected to what he said earlier. He's going to continue with his lecture, his, uh, I think the, we had a couple of chapters where it was titled, uh, Elihu is uh, like uh, correcting the um, uh, the friends of Job, the three friends of Job, and maybe there another chapter that said Elihu's, uh, you know, uh, uh, correcting Job himself. But but he's he's not finished. He's going to go on. He's not finished telling them, uh, you know, how the, the, these men that he thought would be wise that they're not wise after all. That and Job, who should be wise, and he. he He's uh, blaming God. Remember the last chapter he was accused of, Job, you're blaming God and saying God is unjust because all these bad things are happening to you. You've, you've uh, uh, lost your family. They were killed. You've lost your, your, your wealth, your assets. That's been taken away. And now you've lost your health. Your health is in horrible you've got boils from the soles of your feet to the top of your head you're in horrible pain and suffering and and obviously all of this has happened because you're wicked and God is punishing you for your wickedness and yet you are saying you're an innocent man and God's punishing you unjustly you're accusing God of being unjust so that's that's what he said to Job earlier, but he's saying now, oh, Job, Job, I'm not finished. I'm going to continue on. Bear with me a little longer. And then, But he says also, God is mighty, yet does not despise anyone, nor regard any as trivial. He is mighty in his strength and power of understanding. Uh, so he's um, he's really beaten up Job verbally, and and he's he says I'm not finished with you yet. Uh, I'll go on to the next verses, but you want to respond to that? I just kind of brought that in to connect it to the previous chapters. Uh, yeah, I would like to uh, mention uh, I do see the gospel in the, uh, that first uh, set of scriptures you read. Did anybody else see that? I guess not too much. I guess I wasn't really thinking about that. But, um, but yeah, I have to agree. This is definitely, you know, him just saying that, you know, he's just got more to say as opposed to, you know, last chapter where he already let Joe have a good piece of his mind. So, um, yep, that's all I have for right this second. Now, for those people who are watching this video now and you have not had the benefit of um, uh, studying Job from the, the beginning. Chapter 1, verse 1, particularly chapter 1 and chapter 2 are essential in order to understand what's happening as, as the, uh, the, the story goes on. Uh, you see what, what's happened here is that Elihu and also the three men that are referred to as the Job's friends, they're all accusing Job of being wicked and that's why these bad things are happening to him and they're all uh, uh, assuming 
that uh, the the principle of reaping and sowing. Uh, by the way, I I've always called it the law of reaping and sowing. And last study on Job, uh, uh, the light came on, and I realized that I should not refer to it as a law. Now, um, I, I, this would probably be a good question to you now. Uh, if I called it the law of reaping and sowing, and and it, uh, based that uh, that that's based on the the, the premise that um, bad things are going to happen to bad people, and good things are going to happen to good people. That's reaping and sowing. If I refer to it as the law of reaping and sowing, can you tell me why I'm wrong? I can refer to it as a principle, but I don't want to refer to it as a law any longer. Why do you think I repented of that? Oh, I'm glad you finally repented of that, and I didn't have to say anything. But since you brought it up, uh, I was going to just say that uh, the principle of reaping and sowing is a subset of the law of sin and death. Okay, back to you. Well, if you were to call, you know, it a law of reaping and sowing, then you're going to say absolutely, you know, in every case that, you know, he who does good gets good and he that does bad gets bad. But, you know, even Jesus himself said, you know, that's not how it happened. says, you know, God will cause the sun to rise on the wicked, you know, and, you know, the not wicked. Or rain will fall on both. So, I mean, it's not going to be that way. It's not going to be just, you know, absolutely that him who does good gets good. Because, I mean, you could do great things, you know, according to the world all your life. But it wouldn't be, you know, enough to save you because, you know, only by believing on Jesus can it save you. So that'd be an example of a bad thing happening to a quote-unquote worldly good person. But yeah, that's all I have for this. Well, I think that uh, there was another very important principle that uh, we discussed last time that is it's important to bring it up again, and and that is the question that we've all heard. We've probably all asked ourselves, and we've probably all been queried by people when we're witnessing to them uh, that, well, why does God allow evil to exist? Why do bad things happen to good people? And uh, of course, I made a, I told you I made a video about that to, uh, in response to that question that I got from one of my doctors, my medical doctors, and. And here, the reason it supplies now is because Job is not the wicked man that Elihu and, and the others are um, the way they're describing him. He's, they say, you're wicked, you need to repent, and because of your wickedness, that's why these bad things are happening to you. Because obviously, there's a law of reaping and sowing. And, uh, and what we should have learned so far is that Wait a second. Job is not a wicked man. He's these bad things are not happened to him as a result of his wickedness. In fact, it's quite the opposite. Uh, Satan is causing these things to happen to him because he's righteous. Satan is trying to break Job to the point that he'll curse God, and then he can go to God and see, see. Even Job, who you say is the best of all, even he curses you if you take away his blessings. So here we have a good man with bad things happening to him. Why did good th bad things happen to good people like Job? In case, in, in fact, Job is probably he was selected of all the people in the whole world by God. He selected and singled out Job, perhaps as the best example that he could come up with. Of the most righteous man he could he could give Satan to examine. So, why do bad things happen to good people? This is the question. But Job is not even aware that it's not God punishing him. His friends are not aware that it's not God. It's actually a satanic attack, isn't it? It seems like I think Brother Eric brought this up a few studies in the past. He says it seems like they're not even aware of the whole concept of satanic attack. Of being attacked by the enemy, and that's what's happening here. Um, so, uh, 
they're they're all the the three friends plus Elihu plus Job. They're all ignorant about what's really going on here. It's a satanic attack. It's not God punishing Job, uh, and and his friends say God's punishing you because you're wicked. Job saying God's punishing me, but I'm good. It doesn't seem right. So that's what's important to understand here. And let me, I'll go on, but first respond to that. Wow, Brother Luke, that would be kind of hard to track that down, find out why they weren't aware of the uh, that perspective in their theological thinking. Of course, they were also ignorant of the law of uh, exceptions, where there are always the exceptions to every rule, uh, at least one. Okay, back to you. I don't have any additional comments as of right now. Okay, let me go on in here. Verse 6. Uh, Elihu continues, he says, He does not withdraw his eyes from the righteous, those in right standing with him, but with kings upon the throne, he has seated them forever, and they are exalted. And if they are bound in bonds of adversity and held by cords of affliction, then he declares to them the true character of their deeds and their transgressions, that they have acted arrogantly with presumption and notions of self-sufficiency. So, um, uh, let me ask you to react to that then, through verse, uh, through verse nine. It's kind of hard to follow old Elihu here. I'm not, or young Elihu. I'm not quite sure what he's getting at. Uh, I'm still stuck on verse three, where it sounded like he was going to uh, uh, bring forth an argument based off of his uh, premonition of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I I don't have too much right now, but so far when he's just talking about exposing like their arrogance and stuff like that, this is mostly just you know a continuation of the same rant that we saw you know in the previous chapter, which is obviously by him being taken out of context. Well, the important thing about these verses is that um, he's continuing to. Uh, uh, argue the, case, the, 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 the the doctrine or the belief that um, uh, God is going to deal with people. That's what the title of this chapter is, according to the, remember, it says, God, Elihu speaks of God's dealings with men. So he's continuing to argue that the God is dealing with people according to what they deserve. And, and again, as I said earlier, that's not a law. Uh, it's, it's, there's, it, it's a principle, but uh, generally we can say, hey, if you do the right things and work real hard, and something, you're going to get good results in your life. But sometimes that person gets hit by a car and suddenly, and, 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 and they don't get what they deserve. Uh, sometimes people are the greatest... They might be the greatest person on earth, like Job, and, and righteous, and, and, and just nothing but praise should go to him, and yet, look what's happened to him. So, the Elihu's whole argument here is invalid. It doesn't apply universally the way they all think. That sometimes bad things do happen to good people. But they can't comprehend that. They they believe that the the proof that Job is wicked is that these bad things have happened to him. Uh, because we we all know that uh, you know if you get sick, it's because you're a sinner. So that's the false impression that they're under, and uh, so these verses here are uh, uh, declaring that. He says. Verse 9, he says, Then he declares to them the true character of their deeds and their transgressions, that they have acted arrogantly with presumption and notions of self-sufficiency. Okay, let me go on to verse 10 here in, in the KJV. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I already read the KJV. Verse 10, 
He opens their ears to instruction and discipline and commands that they return from evil. If they hear and serve him, they will end their days in prosperity and their years in pleasantness and joy. But if they do not hear and obey, they will die by the sword of God's destructive judgments and they will die in ignorance without true knowledge. That's through verse 12. Hey, Brother Luke, uh, it looks like somebody's here uh, that has not been introduced yet. Okay. Yeah. Hey, it's Brother Nephilim Free. Uh, Brother Evan. Hi, brother. I, ho I hope I didn't ignore you too long. I wasn't aware that you were there until uh, uh, Brother Eric s s uh, acknowledged Hi, you. Evan. How you doing? Hey, no, you weren't ignoring me. I, you were busy, and I was just listening. Hey, good evening, everybody. Merry Christmas. God bless you. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Hey, thank you, Brother Evan. Uh, uh, this is uh, Brother Evan Phillips. His, his YouTube channel he is uh, Nephilim Free. I hope everybody will subscribe to his channel. He's the best I've ever, ever seen uh, at def defending... Uh, um, the Bible and creation and if arguing against atheism. So go to his channel and subscribe and it'll be a great blessing to you. Uh, now Brother Evan, um, I don't know how much of this you've heard, but uh, whatever you've heard, can you respond to it up to this point? I, I was thinking while you were reading those passages, I, I think there's plenty of Christians are saying the same thing today. If you'll, um, you know, you, the bad in your life, all the bad in your life is because you're not following God. You're not following God. And, uh, there may be a vein of truth in that, but, you know, people tend to abuse that way of thinking, I think. And I guess Job's friends were kind of doing the same thing. What do you think? Yeah, I can't believe you're still chewing on that bone. Uh, I'm sorry, Stephen. Go ahead. Uh, it's all good. Yeah, but this is just more of just a continuation of, you know, the law of, you know, reaping and sowing, saying that, you know, if they, you know, listen, then, you know, they'll be rewarded. But, you know, if not, if they're disobedient, then they're just going to pay for it. So it's just more of just a continuation on, like, the, you know, at least from his perspective, you know, saying it's absolute. It's just the law of, you know, reaping and sowing. And just saying that, you know, that the bad guys, you know, just get what they deserve. But again, you know, he's saying this in error and it's kind of abusing it at this point. Now, I told you that I, I repented over my use of the term law of reaping and sowing. I've used that term for many, many years. Uh, and it's only last the last chapter of Job that I said I saw the light and realized that I should not refer to reaping and sowing as a law because we know that there are exceptions. Sometimes bad things happen to good people. And this, what's going on with Job is a perfect example of that. Um, Job is not being, uh, all these bad things are not a punishment from God because he's wicked. In fact, he's the opposite. He's the most righteous man could, God could choose in the world as an example for Satan to examine. So uh, you just said, Brother Stephen, the law of reaping and sowing. I hope you'll also learn to, to rephrase it. It's a principle of reaping and sowing, but obviously it's not a law. It's not 100% apply all the time. I agree, and I think God uses bad circumstances in our lives to prune us and to teach us, uh, you know, to strengthen us ultimately and to uh, to grow us as a character, as a person. I think somebody who's suffered real heartache in their life knows, has built character, uh, or I won't say built character, but has revealed character, developed, blossomed character within themselves that they did not have maybe before they suffered emotionally. I think it's widely understood by people around the world that, that hardship brings something good out of a person, and uh, some it builds you know some kind of strength, reveals an inner character in them, and I believe God allows that to happen to people, and He'll, in the case of Christians, His children, I believe He will use that. I, I'm not saying that I believe God brings hardship on those who follow Him. I'm saying that if hardship occurs in their life. God will take advantage of it if he can, and he, of course, he, 
he can do anything. Uh, he will he will use that to to wisen up, to make more wise, make stronger a Christian, and to bring some something beautiful about inside them that it, it, depths, it adds depth to their soul. So yeah, I agree with you, brother. Um, that uh, God does allow bad things to happen to good people, but uh, being His children, He will take advantage of it and use it for some kind of good. Yeah, I, I, the verse that comes to my mind that uh, supports your point there is that uh, uh, I'm not going to quote it, I guess, but uh, all things work for the good for those who love the Lord. Right, that thought came to my mind too. Uh, so we do know that the, in the book of Hebrews it tells us about God chastising his children. So we know that God does act in our life to discipline us, uh, to help us to grow and mature spiritually. Um, and we know that God can punish wickedness, but we also know that, uh, that it's not a uh, absolute law that everything that bad happens to somebody is a result of their wickedness. Sometimes things just, unfortunately, if someone does it, some, like I've, I've known people who've had perfect uh, health habits and yet they, they get uh, sick and die from a disease that they didn't, uh, you would never expected them because they were the perfect example of following health habits. Um, they both agreed that Wow, it's so good to have Evan here, uh, such uncomfort. I, I hope I'm subscribed to you, Evan. Uh, I'll make sure I rectify that if I'm not. Hey, we should make him one of my lawyers. <laughs> wow, thank you, brother. Uh, brother Evan, uh, do me one favor, though. Uh, when you're not talking, just mute yourself because I'm getting a, little, getting a little feedback, okay? I'm going to go on and, and read a little further and then ask give you all to respond again. Uh, verse... Uh, I, I also I read the whole chapter in the KJV first, and now I'm looking at it more uh, closely. But I'm looking at the Amplified because it's also serving as a kind of a commentary. Uh, I think I'm on uh, verse. Um, oh, also let me make make a comment here that talks about uh, in verse 10. He opens their ears to instruction and discipline and commands that they return from evil. If they hear and serve him, uh, they will end their days in prosperity. So that portion of verses we didn't really d discuss, and I think it deserves uh, discussion, and that is it's referring to repenting. And uh, if we will repent and change our ways, that's so what do you have to say about that portion of scriptures? Oh, that's the Old Testament law, uh, definition for repentance. Turn from your iniquity. Okay, thank God that's not the New Testament definition, huh? Okay. I, w I would say that the, uh, the, the, even now, uh, the, the definition of repentance is, is twofold or more. It, we, we know that there is a, a group of people that misuse the word repent regarding salvation. Um, it, for us to repent to be saved simply means that that we are changing our mind about how we get saved instead of thinking that we get saved through our own religious efforts we change our mind reject that and, and now our new way of thinking is we get saved because we're trusting the Savior Jesus Christ to save us uh, however, it does. It is still valid to use the word repent today as changing your mind about how to live your life. That's still a valid point. It's just that that is not part of a formula for salvation. So I'll ask anybody to respond to that before we go on. I think people there. There are unfortunately many Christians who do a, a misuse the word. Uh, they mistreat other Christians with the word. They, uh, they point the finger at other Christians with the word. Uh, and, and they'll make it, there are Christians who make it sound like you haven't repented if you haven't eliminated every sin from your life. And that's, of course, we know according to the scriptures, false. Look what Paul said. I have a war in my flesh. You know, in my mind, I serve in God. And in my flesh, I, I, I unfortunately, I serve the law. 
uh, what a wretched man that I am. I thank God through Jesus Christ that you are ever a savior. You know, so uh, did Paul repent? Oh, certainly he was a repentant man. But did that mean that he ceased all sin activity and that he was, uh, con you know, able to make himself holy by, uh, you know, resisting temptation always? Absolutely not. So repentance is certainly a change of mind and heart about your sin mm -hmm. and about, like you said, brother, uh, how one goes about being saved, that it is trust in the Savior and not, not upon your own goodness or works or any, any other means. So uh, unfortunately, people do abuse, misuse the word. And uh, you're right. It's it's a change of heart and mind, and and, and putting the trust in Jesus Christ. It's not uh, uh, as some Christians are who uh, are are, I guess I don't know how to say it, but self righteous, uh, mis mis misdefine the word as as the elimination of all sin activity or falling into temptation from one's life, and that's simply not what repentance is. Okay, well said. Uh, do, you, do you have anything to say about this, uh, Brother Stephen, before we move on? Uh, I think he, I think you guys hit the nail on the head pretty hard, so I don't think I need to have any additional comment added. Uh, I also want to respond to what Brother uh, uh, Eric said, uh, uh, thinking perhaps he would uh, employ uh, Brother Evans' services as his one of his lawyers. Uh, he uses the term lawyer it's uh, it's intended, I think, to be humorous, but also to make the point that he he goes to certain people he trusts for spiritual advice in ter terms of understanding the scriptures. And I would say that if if you made Brother Evan one of your advisors in terms of uh, how to deal with uh, you know the uh, the false teachings about Darwinism, about atheism, and that that you certainly, of course. Brother Evans qualified to talk about soteriology and salvation and everything else, but I just I just say that if you if you need help understanding creation, the, the account of creation and defending it, then then yeah certainly make him your top advisor for that brother. Uh, I'll move on now. Um, let's go to let me see now we're on uh, verse thirteen I think. Um, but the godless in heart store up anger at the divine discipline. They do not cry to him for help when he binds them with cords of affliction. They die in youth, and their life ends among the cult prostitutes. He rescues the afflicted in their affliction and opens their ears so that they pay attention to his voice in times of oppression. Um, all right. Uh, again, this is it's, it's so important to understand that what what Elihu and what the three friends are telling Job is 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 it's true, but the problem is it doesn't apply to this particular circumstance that Job is facing. Uh, you know, they're not making false statements about how God will sometimes come in and, and intervene in, in, in lives and, and, and uh, correct people, destroy wickedness. And yeah, I'm, that, there's, it, it's, it's true, but it, it's not valid in Job's case because Job is not suffering from God's punishment because of his wickedness. Job is suffering because of, he's righteous. And God said, there's a righteous man that, and, and Satan says, I'll prove you wrong that even the most righteous man will curse you. And he doesn't love you. It's only because he's blessed. Let me take away all his blessings and I'll prove to you he, he'll be cursed. So uh, unfortunately, Job, Elihu, and the three friends, they didn't read chapter one and two. So they don't have the perspective that we have who understand what's really going on. So let me see if you want to respond to that before I go further. Wow, that just emphasizes Job's great character. And, uh, wow, who can match that, huh? Oh, thank God the New Testament and the New Covenant is so much easier now. Okay, back to you. Yeah, I mean, 
Job was, as it was said, he was, you know, righteous. You know, he was, you know, a great person. And as I'll correctly define it now, they, you know, misuse the principle, you know, of reaping and sowing. You know, in this case, you know, every time you know, they keep, you know, slaying him, saying that he's, blame, you know, blaming God for getting what he rightfully deserves. I mean, pretty much that's what's been going on these last, you know, couple of chapters, you know, that we've seen. But, you know, in reality, you know, this is all out of context. You know, Job does not deserve, you know, the punishment that he's taking because, you know, this is being, this is by Satan, you know, and not by God. But these guys are just misinterpreting it, and they just keep on, you know, pinning it on him, you know, at this point. Okay. Uh, Brother Evan, anything to say before I move on? No, that sounded good. Uh, yeah, except I see the same. I see. I still see the same thing happening today with Christians. Uh, uh, some, some unfortunately point the finger at others, and and and, and they bl they blame all their life's problems on their on 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 them and uh, their their uh, their life uh, because they haven't become as righteous as Job, and that's so. People are doing the same thing today. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. Uh, well, I've, I've said this before, but I'll, uh, I'll say it again for those who haven't heard it. Uh, uh, I've experienced this same kind of, I, I guess I could call it accusations or even persecution. Uh, for If you watch my videos on street preaching, you see me preaching in a wheelchair, and that's because for several years I couldn't stand and walk more than a, a, a minute. Uh, uh, so uh, would, many times people would come up to me and want to pray for me, and some of these people were into this uh, uh, name it and claim it and faith, uh, uh, word of faith uh, thing. That they, they believe that uh, if you're if you're sick, it's because there's sin in your life. You need to get the sin out of your life. So, brother, brother Luke, you got to examine yourself and if there's get some sin out of your life. That's why you're you're in a wheelchair. Uh, or uh, or they say, well, if you pray, you're prayed for this, but you're not being healed. is because your faith is not strong enough. You need more faith. Uh, and so this is something that does a lot of damage to people because there are people that they are sick not because they're sin in their life, and they're not in a, and they're, they're they're not being healed. Well, it's, it doesn't always boil down to the fact that uh, their faith is not enough. How about all the people who are praying for them? Their faith is not enough too, I guess. Uh, so, yeah, I, this is still going on today. This kind of an attitude and the way that we're treating each other over affliction. People are sometimes afflicted, and yet uh, it's not because of their wickedness, and it's and and it's not because of their lack of faith. Uh, anything else before I move on? Yeah, I think uh, that uh, uh, people like that that do that, believe in that sort of theology, are putting too much trust in a preacher who got it from somebody else who's, who was a preacher who got it from another preacher instead of studying the Word of God. If they'd study the Word of God, they'd find that those ideas are false instead of believing what a, what a teacher, who a preacher who has false ideas is saying. Too bad they don't go straight to the word and find out what it says about stuff instead. Yeah, amen. Okay, let me continue reading here now. Uh, uh, verse uh, uh, verse sixteen. Then indeed he enticed you from the mouth of distress and confinement into a broad place where there is no constraint or distress. And that which was set on your table was full of fatness, rich food. But you, Job, were full of judgment on the wicked. Judgment and justice take hold of you. Do not let wrath entice you into scoffing. And do not let the greatness and the extent of the ransom turn you aside. Will your wealth be sufficient to keep you from the confinement of distress? Or will all the force of your strength do it? Do not long for the night when people vanish from their places. Take heed and be careful. Do not turn to wickedness, for you have chosen this, the vice of complaining against God, rather than learning from affliction. Let's end it with verse 21. So let me ask you to respond to that. Well, I just about lost all respect for Elihu at this point. But I've gained much respect 
for everybody on this panel tonight. Okay. Hmm. Well, again, just more of a continuation of this. I guess it says when I see this here in the um, in the King James, how it shows out. It says remove the out of the straight, you know, into a broad place. And that kind of reminds me, you know, of what Jesus said, how to enter through the straight gate, you know, rather than the broad gate, even though this is something else completely. It's just I remember that, like, the linkage of terms there. But um, still, this is just a, a continue of just the reprimand at this point, just continuing to talk about, you know, how he's blaming God and all that stuff. Uh, Brother Evan, any comments on that? I think it's interesting that the book of Job uses the, the word ransom repeatedly. Uh, and uh, this is, of course, the, the fact that uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ is found throughout the Bible, Old Testament, and knew that he, pay, he, he paid a ransom for our, for our lives. And that's an interesting fact to me. I just wanted to point that out. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, many times as we've gone through Job, we've, we've found the gospel in there, and it's been a big surprise to to us. See, I've read the book of Job numerous times over the years, but I've never attempted to slowly break it down and analyze it and really try to study it and understand it the way we are now. And uh, I've been really happy to see the gospel throughout the book of Job, too. So you are right. Um, the, th the thing, though, that amazes me about, see, it, it, could you imagine having your family killed? all your wealth and you're the rich maybe the richest man in the world and most admired and respected person all that's taken away from you your health is destroyed you're suffering horribly and then on top of it your friends come and just accuse you and demean you and, and blame you over and over and over again falsely accuse you there was one chapter where Job defended himself and he was talking about all the things he's done uh, and, it, and, and to me, uh, that chapter showed me, and I have no reason to believe that Job was uh, exaggerating or, or lying about anything he'd done, uh, be, because jo God himself said, this is the right, most righteous man. So when Job actually explained, in maybe five or ten chapters ago, he explained what his life really was. Uh, he really was so impressive. It was amazing. So imagine that's the way your life is, and everything is taken away from you, and now all your friends are falsely accusing you of wickedness and being mean to, to widows and, 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 and children and just horrible things, and it's false accusations. I don't know if you've ever been falsely accused of anything, but I have a, a couple of times in my life, and it's a horrible, helpless feeling when people are accusing you falsely, you know the truth, but you can't prove it. Uh, so that would be a, I mean, to me, it would be w maybe worse than all the other suffering, but to be falsely accused in that way. So uh, before I, have I a go question. on, yeah. Um, <clears throat> I haven't been present for all your studies of the book of Job, and I don't know it the way you do. I'm sh quite sure I don't know it nearly as well as you. Have you found that uh, in this study of the book of Job that there were moments uh, when uh, Job actually questions himself and, and doubts whether or not he truly is a righteous man and wonders is or my friends telling me the truth does he have uh, does he have lapses does he show that vulnerability where he at least for a, a, a briefly he falls into the trap of their 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 lie, their accusations no uh, no he he con consistently defends himself as an innocent man interesting and uh, uh, but at, at one point that he, he he does reach the point where they convince him that God is afflicting him and that's when he starts questioning God and saying um, I know I'm innocent and if God's afflicting me then then this doesn't seem right it, you know and that's why Elihu is continuing the last couple of chapters. Elihu's at the point where he's now accusing Job on top of all his other wickedness. Job, now you're even accusing God of being unjust because you're saying God's punishing you unjustly. 
Oh boy, that's really a double whammy they're they're doing there. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let me read a little further here. Um, let me see which. Uh, I think I'm in. What verse was I on? Let me see. Uh, Okay, I guess I'm on 21. Take heed and be careful. Do not, oh no, verse 22. Behold, God is exalted in his power. Who is a ruler or a teacher like him? Who has appointed God his way? Who can say to him, you have done wrong? Remember that you should magnify God's work of which men have sung. All men have seen God's work. Man looks at it from a distance. Behold, God is exalted, and we do not know him. The number of his years is unsearchable, for he draws up the drops of water. They distill rain from the mist, which the cloud pours down. They drop abundantly upon mankind. Can anyone understand the spreading of the clouds or the thundering of his pavilion? Behold, he spreads his lightning around him against the dark clouds, and he covers the depths of the sea. For by these mighty acts he judges the peoples, he gives food and abundance, he covers his hands with the lightning and commands it to strike the mark. His thundering voice declares awesomely his presence. The cattle also are told of his coming storm. Um, now I know, Brother Evan, you... Uh, you reminded me that in chapter 38, you wanted to be sure to join the conversation. And I, I, as I was reading this, I, when I read it initially, I'm thinking, oh, I think that Brother Evan would probably have something to say about this. And uh, am, am I right? Is there anything in there, this, these ch verses I just read here, that, uh, that really uh, uh, you can shed some light on? Well, I, I think... Uh that a, a simplistic interpretation of those passages about God doing this and, and you know, the clouds and, and, and whatnot would be, uh, you know, and the atheists will twist that. They'll say, oh, so, you you know, your God is just like one of the sky daddies of the ancient world, you know. He actually makes every lightning bolt happen. But the Christian view is God doesn't necessarily intentionally make every single lightning bolt happen exactly where it is. Uh, it, it's that lightning exists because God made it happen because he disrupted this earth with the flood. So he, he made lightning, but he didn't. He doesn't say, oh, I'm going to make a lightning bolt here, and I'm going to make a lightning bolt there, and another one here, and another, I'm going to make one right there right now. It's not like God is proactively making every lightning bolt intentionally. And I don't think that's what the passages are saying. But the fact that lightning would not exist if God had not foreordained that, that this process would take place that the rain would come, that the clouds would exist, that the sun would shine through them. God foredetermined that these things would be. It's not that God micromanages every molecule on the earth and, and, and makes every drop of rain fall where exactly where it does. It, it's that God makes rain because God made the earth so that it will rain. You know, and uh, so th I think that's uh, something to remember as we uh, read passages which relate to God's power and his creation in the scriptures. All right, very good. Uh, Brother uh, Stephen and Brother Eric, any comments on those verses? Well, that was a great uh, perspective. Uh, what if we did ascribe all that to God being a micromanager of his creation, being he was so great that he could do it so effortlessly? Uh, what would be the implications of that? Well, I believe God, of course, God has the power to do all that he wishes. But scripture tells us that uh, not even a bird falls to the ground that God doesn't will it. Uh, it by the, the passage, using the proper understanding of the word will doesn't mean that God determined that that bird would fall uh, on purposely. It's that it falls within his will to allow it to take place. Consider the word, the use of the word will. If you were taught, if you were in, uh, let's say, uh, 10th grade in the uh, English school in, in, in 1860 or 50, you would have a different understanding of the word will than we do today. And the King James is using uh, Middle English, and it's using a different understanding of the word will than we're using today. So when, the, when typically, not every example maybe, but when we find the word will, 
often in the King James Bible, for example, uh, it, it's uh, it's a statement that, um, for example, in in 1850, if somebody says um, asks a question of another, uh, will you will you have it that uh, the horses will be fed today? And if somebody says I will, that doesn't mean that uh, that they will do it themselves. It means that it is their will that the horses be fed that afternoon. See, it, it's it is my will that it will take place. My 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 choice that it shall happen. Uh, but it's he's not saying that he's purposely in, in going to hand feed the horses himself. So today we have a u different use of the word will. When 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 people use the word will today, uh, it, 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 they typically mean. Uh, uh, to do, you know, to take action, to make happen, but uh, the uh, the King James is using the word more than anything as uh, a, a allowance uh, it, it, that it's God's will that He allows uh, a thing to happen, not that He proactively causes it. Yeah, let me say before uh, Brother Eric does any, any follow up questions here, which he's known to do, uh, that uh, the the potential problem. You said, is there any harm in it? The potential problem is has already been fulfilled by those who hold to this predestination, sovereignty, uh, Calvinistic viewpoint. And, and that is they will take God's omnipotence, which means God is able to do whatever he wants. He's all-powerful. And they ex and they put that on steroids and say, he's not just omnipotent. He actually determines everything. He controls everything. He's so he's so sovereign. He doesn't just have the ability to do it. He actually controls every molecule, every run. Exactly. Drop. That is exactly what Calvinists do. Exactly. And, and the, the the problem with that, of course, is then they extrapolate it to man's free will and say, "We well, don't have a free will. He's even controlling every thought you have, Brother Luke. Every word you speak, he's controlling you like a puppet." And every everything that you do, he's making you do it, and that makes God the sinner and me the innocent man. But uh, now, normally, I do these broadcasts uh, from seven to eight p.m. nightly, and normally I don't have a real strict uh, time constraints. But I promised my wife tonight I would take her to dinner immediately following the show, so um, I I would love to even have us all talk further about this. Maybe we can pick it up more to, uh, next time. But uh, for tonight, I think we need to end this discussion and, and, and con we conclude every broadcast with an invitation for salvation. So let me do, let me do that real, real quickly here. It doesn't take long to tell people about uh, uh, salvation. If it takes very long, then you're probably explaining it incorrectly because salvation is simple. Salvation mm -hmm. is easy. Well, most people in the world today, most people throughout all of history, they believe that somehow they can get, work their way to heaven through personal merit. Uh, all the religions of the world are based on that. If you're a good enough person, God will let you into heaven. If you're not good enough, you don't get into heaven, you go to hell instead. So well, you need to repent of that. You need to uh, take that philosophy and send that philosophy to hell where it belongs. And that's the philosophy of the devil. And that's working for salvation. What I've got for, to tell you tonight is the gospel. And it's a Greek word that means good news. The good news is that salvation is actually a free gift that's offered to everyone. Anybody in the world can receive it. And... All you've got to do to receive this gift of et eternal life and salvation is trust Jesus instead of trying to get there on your own. And and we, we want you to know who Jesus is and what he's done for you. He is God Almighty. He's eternal. And he became a man, Jesus Christ, and he became a man in order to die. He had to become a man to die. And he died on a cross and that death on the cross served as a payment for the sins of all mankind. All of our sins were charged to Jesus on that cross. All of our sins are paid for right now. Because he paid for our sins, we have access to God. We can have a relationship with God now. But you can only do it through Jesus Christ. This icon I'm going to show you now is a picture of what Jesus is doing here. And that is... He's reaching out. He wants to embrace you. He wants to pull you up to heaven. It's up to you now. Since he, he's willing, are you willing to embrace him, trust him? 
I'm asking you to put your faith in Jesus and stop believing in your own ability. Uh, rely on Jesus to get you to heaven. Depend completely on Jesus Christ and give up on, on working for salvation. And if you do that, uh, not only your, your sins are paid for, but you're guaranteed to have eternal life in heaven. Now, why should you believe this? Why should you trust Jesus? Jesus said he'd give us a sign to prove his claims are true. That he's God, that he's... Oh, let me get this on. He, he said he would give us a sign to prove that all of his claims were true. One claim is he's God Almighty. The other claim is that he's the Savior. The other, the other claim is that he has power over life and death. And he proved it by raising himself from the dead. After three days dead in the tomb, he raised himself back to life. He walked on the earth bodily resurrected for 40 days among 500 witnesses. They saw him. They talked to him. They touched him. They ate with him. And that bodily resurrection is the proof that gives me confidence that my faith in Jesus is justified. I hope you'll trust him too. And I know normally I give this time to Brother Stephen, but I'm, only because I'm short on time, I'm going to skip that for tonight. Uh, so um, I'm just going to give everybody a chance to just take one moment here and say good night to everybody. Thank you all for participating with me tonight, and I hope everybody will join me nightly at 7 p.m. Each one of you just say your good night. Good night, brother, and God bless you. Thank you. Good night, everybody, and thank you, Jesus. Good night, everybody. Come to Jesus and live. All right, brothers. Thanks again. And uh, I'm going to rush off because I promised my wife I'd take her right after the show. And uh, please uh, join me again tomorrow if possible. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ. Amen. Have a great evening.